My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramer. I'll do it, my friends. I'm just trying to make a little money. My job, not just to entertain, but to put it all in context. So call me at 1-800-743-CNBC. Tweet me, Jim Kramer. Not all rallies are created equal. Some are just plain better than others. Today's move with the Dow gaining 254 points, this has been climbing 0.87%, and then NASDAQ, poll volume 1.11%, actually did feel better than the, you know, kind of run-of-the-mill rally because it was as broad-based as you can get. And that's a terrific sign of staying power. But we had a real thicket to get through, so let's parse what happened today and figure out if the market can keep rebounding because it's not clear to me that it will. First, we came in with a negative oscillator reading, minus 5.64%. Not as negative as it was a, 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 a couple days before, but still a coil spring. Now, you know I follow the SP oscillator religiously. When you have many down days, you can almost always count on a bounce. I like to look at a year's worth of the oscillator. We bounced off oversold levels in August and twice in October of last year at almost the exact same readings. And then the market just roared until this three-week sell-off. It's reassuring that the market can still bounce, isn't it? Because it means that there's some rationality to things, but not every oversold bounce has staying power. The oversold oscillator readings in August and in early October did not, in retrospect, indicate a true bottom. As a matter of fact, things went right back to being awful. So maybe it is a bit of cold comfort. Second, the Nasdaq 100 started out marginally higher today. Then again, at 948, it plummeted, dropping from 17.182 to 17.010. It then bottomed at 11.15. Very mysteriously, frankly, it started its way up. This boot did, though, break a key pattern that we've had for weeks. When the market opens up, then starts going down, and then stays down. Nothing in particular happened to turn things around. But the bond market seemed tame. Oil wasn't running. Unusual for this market, isn't it? The fact is the buyers came in because stocks got low enough to tempt them. The SP never went negative. But remember, the real selling's carnage has been in the NASDAQ. Third, this was really interesting. The market shrugged off the sudden reversal of a gigantic company, of Verizon, after an up opening. The giant telco company reported in the early morning the stock initially rallied 3% in the performed market trading. Then when the regular market bell rang, the stock still opened up, but it was appreciably down from those lofty pre-market levels. Verizon then experienced a sickening decline as we realized there were continued customer losses and the cash flow disappointed. Almost every line item came in weaker. There could have been a lot of negative read-throughs from Verizon. Could be a sign of weakness for Apple or the broader consumer, but none of those came up. If the market were looking for reasons to sell off, Verizon stock falling 4.6% would have been an easy one. But it didn't happen. Absence of a negative. Fourth, when Tesla goes down, it tends to hurt everything water-related. Today, though, Tesla's price cuts $2,000 off the price of three of their five models, and it's continued travails around layoffs and executive departures actually produced rallies among its big competitors, Ford and GM. Ford actually led the entire S&P with a 6% gain. Why? The takeaway here was that people still want cars. They just don't want Teslas or even EVs in general. We own Ford for the Travel Trust. And by the way, you can join the CBC Investing Club ahead of Wednesday's big club meeting to find out more. That's a noon meeting. Now, the long story short is Ford has the best non-electric lineup, including hybrids, popular internal combustion engines, and yes, the F-150 truck line, the greatest selling truck line in history. And that's where the money is going. Hey, by the way, Ford's one of the cheapest stocks in the entire S&P 500 even after today. When you see that kind of action, it means that markets are willing to buy cheap, even though it also means it's selling dear. Fifth, speaking of buying cheap, the financials just keep running. Have you seen that? It is a very impressive move. You can see the stocks of J.P. Morgan and Bank of America, two laggers, they've come roaring back, but nothing comes close to American Express. With a 13-point advance last Friday off a quarter that was initially panned as a disappointment before people reassessed in the stock on fire. You know, it was almost up another two bucks today. Six, NVIDIA, the stock bounced. Now, listen to this. Don't laugh. This company has lost more than $300 billion in market capitalization from the top, almost a straight line. It's been a hideous hideous stock, as any decline I can recall, frankly, down 10% alone on Friday. Now, the stock mounted in advance today, but not enough to erase Friday's gains. NVIDIA's gone from being the star of the show to being the good of the game, and I'm not talking about the greatest of all time. Of course, we've learned from multiple pieces of research today that NVIDIA, the business, is doing quite well. Now, I think the stock 
finally got cheap enough to start tempting people. I don't want to make too much of NVIDIA because all high multiple stocks came roaring back today. But if NVIDIA couldn't rally today, it would have been a horrible sign. Luckily, it didn't happen. I don't know how much staying power NVIDIA stock is going to have, though, tomorrow. Because after the close tonight, Cadence, a very close partner of NVIDIA, guided down for both sales and earnings. And that is surprisingly bad. The House of Pain. I need to dig deeper in this one to see the impact on video because we've got multiple reads today and video's doing quite well. I don't get it. 7,000 representatives gave Meta and Google a lift by banning TikTok. We don't know what the Senate will do, but it's pretty darn good news for our companies. Now, Mark Zuckerberg did a good job designing this reel. He's a viable TikTok competitor. He was involved with it, apparently, at every step of the way. And that will cause his numbers to jump. So, I got to tell you, that stock could be very interesting again, even though it reports this week. Eighth and final development, Salesforce was talking to Informatic about buying the enterprise software coming for about, a little, actually about $12 billion. Some argue this potential purchase price would demonstrate a lack of discipline and you get beaten up for it. Salesforce was going back to its old ways, spending like a drunken sailor. Turns out the deal's not happening. The company's much more disciplined than the critics thought, so the stock jumped. Salesforce could have been crushed if it bought Informatica. Now, there are a bunch of counters to all these positives. First, if the trusted oscillator is trusted, and it should be, that means we're going to go up and then down again, then up again, then down again before we reach a good level for an advance. Looks like a W. We could rally for 10 days before we get punished, or even less, but the punishment will come. I think we need to be ready for that. So after a couple days, you got to want to reposition with more cash. I will explain that on Wednesday's uh, uh, club meeting, too, because we're going to do that. Second, we have a bunch of bond auctions this week. I am very concerned that we can't get through the week without a bond sell-off. The bonds are very much in control here. More on that later. And the only reason we could bounce today is that we had a tame bond market. I'd be stunned if bonds don't move much down in, in price and up in yield into these three auctions. It's a two-year, it's a five-year, it's a seven-year, all of which are abnormally large. Now, look, if we do get through those auctions and we get a good personal consumption expenditures number on Friday, then we deserve to keep going higher. But I think it's a mighty tough, tough gauntlet to run through. Kind of like that one with Clint Eastwood, very hard. Third, today's bounce might just be because nothing happened in the Middle East this weekend, absence of a negative. I don't think that'll continue to be the case. If you want to bet on peace in the Middle East, be my guest, but history says that's a bad wager. Finally, remember that if a stock goes down 5% and then goes up 5%, you do not get back to even, even though a lot of people seem to be confusing that, you're still down. We had a lot of stocks that went down a great deal last week. They're going to have to climb back on the tree a great deal in order to be where they are. So if you're down 5%, you got to go back a little more than 5 I think it's a tall order. Another reason why the oscillator reading is a bit of cold cover. So let me give you the bottom line here. Very mixed picture. I think the positives do outweigh the negatives, at least for this moment. History, however, says it won't last. So be ready for another decline. Raise some cash. When is it going to go back down? I don't know. Probably should go up first. But there's just a lot to worry about. And I don't want you to think or get complacent. Let's go to Sharon in Minnesota. Sharon. Well, yeah, Jim. Uh, I'm a club member, and I have a question about ELF. I know that Ultra got hit, but do you think that ELF is a buy, hold, or a sell? Okay, so ELF is a high multiple stock that didn't used to be, and yet it was up today. So I got, first of all, Sharon, thank you for being a member of the club. I hope to see you on the Wednesday uh, club meeting. But ELF is good. Uh, ELF is. Uh, other than the chart pattern, which is not that good. But uh, we, we spoke we spoke to, to uh, Tarang, I mean, just, I don't know, less than 10 days ago, and things are really, really strong. So I would like to, you to be in that stock. Let's go to Trey in Texas. Trey! Jim, I rage canceled my auto policy on notice of an 8% premium increase, only to discover a lapse in coverage can be far more detrimental. My new 90% higher rate, paired with effective anger resolution classes, has really put a strain on my budget. As insurance companies are doing far better than I am, I wanted to see if you think I should buy Progressive here and share the Yes, way. the answer is absolutely yes. And not just because of the, uh, the anger management thing, which is really something I don't know a thing about. You'd have to help me with that. Um, but I will tell you this, the Progressive's doing incredibly well. By the way, they are the most AI-oriented of all the insurers. Interesting, isn't it? They price really, really well. Now, all right, listen to me. I think the positive for the moment in this market outweigh the negatives, although that cadence took my breath away. Remember, they are the partner of NVIDIA. But history says it won't last anyway. Man Money tonight, what's driving the NASDAQ's recent downturn, including some Supermicro's 23% drop on Friday? I'm going to give you my take. I think it's going to surprise you. Then Netflix. 
No chill. After the company's post earnings decline, I'm examining the bull and the bear case for the company. And gold just had its worst day since February of 2023. But after this year's run-up, is it time to consider the yellow metal? I'm going to sit down with the CEO of Barrick Gold. The stock's not doing that well, I know. To get maybe make a little sense of the action. How about that? So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Cramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Cramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com. Or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com. All right, here's one for you. How does a stock lose nearly a quarter of its value in a single session? As Super Microcomputer did last Friday, when it plunged from 928 down to 713. All right, we can rely on the reason given to us by journalists that the company failed to pre-announce on an upside surprise. Like, it's done in seven of the last eight quarters, so I get that. Somehow people have been lulled into thinking that this data center and artificial intelligence stalwart will pre-announce to the upside every time it announces when its quarter will be reported. Superbreaker did that often enough that I think its shareholders just got somehow addicted to it. Some blame the decline on the stinging after effects that Taiwan Semi's cautious guidance gave us. Cast a poll on the whole tech center, sector, I'll give them that. But I don't think either of these reasons explain what happened to Supermicro. As a matter of fact, I think they're purely intellectually lazy thinking. There's a simple reason Supermicro and its high price to earnings multiple brethren have been getting hit over and over. Because bond yields have been soaring ever since we realized that the Fed was likely wrong when it predicted we would get at least three rate cuts this year. This is a market that's become way more hostile to richly valued growth stocks because that's what happens when inflation's stubborn and interest rates don't seem like they'll go down anytime soon, even though we thought they would. Some get hit harder than others, though, because they might not have much of a competitive moat, even like it seems that they do. For example, Supermicro's partner with NVIDIA, providing server solutions for the world's best chip maker. But it's not an essential partner. My turn but it's not essential. Supermicro has become integral to the artificial intelligence people because it makes non-proprietary products that will help customers who are using NVIDIA's ultra-fast chips. I wouldn't put it in the same camp as NVIDIA's true partners with proprietary relationships like Cadence, which reported this evening, waiting to hear about that. i got to do more work on it. And Synopsys. Cadence makes software that helps NVIDIA design its chips. Synopsys also offers design automation solutions to help uh, build the com complicated supercomputers that are now NVIDIA's mainstay. I know people just think it's a, a chip company, but when they put them all together, what they have is a supercomputer. Now, these are very different from Supermicro, which I put more in the Broadcom or Veltech camp as important ancillaries to NVIDIA, okay? Essentials and ancillaries. But there's one thing that NVIDIA and Supermicro have very much in common. They peaked on the exact same day. Did you know that? They peaked on March 8th. It's impossible to overstate that day's impact on tech. NVIDIA hit $974. Supermicro hit $1,299. NVIDIA is now at $795. Supermicro at $717. That's pretty big declines. If you Google March 8th, you'll see that shares of Marvell Tech were selling off after the company reported a shortfall the previous evening, where their weaker old tech business couldn't be offset by the strength in the new optical plumbing that's needed for accelerated computing and generative AI. Marvell Tech was dragged down by weakness in networking and storage, which are a real downturn. Just, there's no signs of those bottoming, at least not yet. And that weakness was confirmed by Taiwan Semi just last week. When we had Marvell CEO Matt Murphy on the show just last week, he didn't sugarcoat it. Although, I got to tell you, he was justifiably proud of the linkage to NVIDIA. That day's shortfall from Marvell, along with Broadcom's failure to do what Supermicro was supposed to do, simply reiterating its forecast instead of raising, were viewed as the cause of a brutal day for all things tech, including NVIDIA. But you know what? That's wrong, too. Forget Marvell Tech. March 8th was the day when we got a stellar employment report. We created 275,000 jobs. Wall Street was expecting 200,000. In short, we learned that the economy is much hotter, much, much hotter than expected. So the Fed had no reason to cut eight rates anytime soon which is why bonds retreated in price and their yields shot up. For me, that's why tech peaked a month and a half ago. Think about it. What the, it, it just makes so much sense. Let, so let's explain what happened that, with that week to put everything in context, okay? Because that's when this market changed its stripes, starting with tech. First, the Labor Department's non-farm payroll report is the single most important piece of data we get from anywhere. 
That report came out the day that NVIDIA peaked. The stock was up 5% in early trading and then finished down more than 5%. That is one of the ugliest island reversals I have ever seen. That's a technician's nightmare of a gap up, crash down, that almost always heralds at least a few days, if not weeks, of declines. In NVIDIA's case, it's been more than six weeks, and I, I don't see any end of it. I know it had a nice bounce today, though. Given that super micro stock is joined at the hip with NVIDIA, correctly or incorrectly, of course it peaked on the same day. But if you were to focus on tech, you would have missed that a host of Fed officials have been talking about how they'd be re- more ready to cut rates if the economy ever looked like it was going to get weaker. So wait, get this. We, we get a red-hot job market with higher wages. You better believe that makes them much less ready to cut rates. You can bet that they were also dead wrong. That's what stinks. Dead wrong. I know that the price deflator we get Friday is very important. So is the consumer price index. And everybody talks about the all importance, the one that the Fed looks at. I get tired of that. You see, because everything stems from the labor report. Because as long as unemployment stays below 4%, it is inconceivable to Fed cut rates. We're at such an historically low unemployment rate that the Fed should never have committed to any rate cuts at all, let alone the three that they did. Or at least the dots said. The dots. Give me a break. Just as important as long as so many people have jobs, consumer spending will stay elevated. As we heard from Americans best on Friday, people keep buying homes, too, pushing up the cost of shelter. No one's hunkering down at 3.8% unemployment. No one. When you surprise the Fed that badly, you get what I think is a double whammy. We need the Fed to be ready to fight inflation to preserve the value of financial assets, given that inflation's still a good bit above their target. But they've spent months talking about rate cuts, which makes them actually, I think, seem clueless. Worse, from the bond market's perspective, it makes the Fed seem weak, which is why we've had a bond market route for weeks now, masked by the occasional flight to quality inspired by the instability of the Middle East. So why did uh, Supermicro get obliterated last Friday? It's the bond market, people. The action in bonds makes us feel like dopes for paying up for any high multiple stock, not just tech. We're seeing consistent weakness in biotech or high multiple drug stocks like Eli Lilly. Not because it's a drug company, for heaven's sake, but because it's got a high price earnings multiple. That's it. Sure, it's most pronounced in tech and not just the generative AI stocks. You see it in all kinds of enterprise software, too. Those are always overvalued. That's the most hallowed high multiple area and also the one that's the most dangerous when long-term interest rates fly up. In the end, the reason Supermicro went down had nothing to do with Supermicro. Everything to do with the fact that interest rates are unable to find their footing. That's what's so important about this week. If we could either get adjusted to the new level where the 10 years yielding at 4.6%, or if we were going down to 4.5%, believe me, super micro stock would have rallied. The whole market, all the high models would have rallied. Here's the bottom line. Interest rates, not earnings, are what's in control right now. We bounced today because rates were calm. That's what's happening. We want to believe that earnings can blow away the bond market, but in reality, it's the other way around. We just forget that that's the case after decades when rates only seem to go lower, even though we just went through the whole process last summer. It's awful hard to get used to the new normal, isn't it? Mid money's back in the Coming up, investors hit pause on Netflix after earnings. Should home gamers believe the plot twist? Or is there more to the story? Kramer breaks it down next. All right, we got to talk about the market's surprisingly negative reaction to the Netflix quarter, where the stock tumbled 9% last Friday. To me, the quarter looked pretty darn good. Yet the stock's in full-blown correction mode here, down more than 13% from its 52-week high a couple of weeks ago. Netflix, beloved, say it ain't so. How'd this happen? This is the most popular stock in the market to most people. First, let me set the stage by explaining what happened here. And then I'll walk you through both the good and the bad examples, the bull and the bear thesis, so to speak, because that's the best way to formulate your own opinion. Remember what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to teach you into understanding how people think on Wall Street so you can make up your mind yourself. In terms of what happened, Netflix reported a huge subscriber beat. No one's disagreeing with that. They added 9.33 million paid users. Again, that's a surprise. Wall Street was looking for less than 6 million. Biggest first quarter subscriber additions since the COVID first, hit, COVID first hit in the first quarter of 2020. Revenue. Revenue came in higher than expected, up nearly 15% year over year, and an acceleration versus the previous quarter. <laughs> Netflix's paid account sharing offering seems to be converting former password share- shares into paid users. Their advertising tier keeps improving. 
And they keep putting out great content that resonates all over the world. House of Pleasure. Best of all, Netflix is quickly becoming a cash machine. They earned $5.28 per share, up 83% year over year, when the analysts were only looking for $4.52. Free cash flow much higher than expected. That's a number that we really care about on the show. On top of that, management gave excellent guidance for the current quarter. So why the heck did the stock sell off like crazy on Friday? Sell, 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 sell. Aside from the fact that the tape was horrendo, especially for tech, there were a couple of real culprits here. First, even though the second quarter guidance looked great, the full-year revenue growth forecast might have seemed a bit lacking. The midpoint of implied revenue number was a tiny bit below what Wall Street was looking for. I think Wall Street would have been fine with it if Netflix reported on Wednesday, frankly. But the full-year forecast suggests that the period of accelerating revenue growth is coming to an end. And the market has become a lot less forgiving of tech stocks. At the same time, management refused to raise their full year uh, free cash flow forecast, which again suggests things will be worse in the second half because they just reported a huge free cash flow beat for the first quarter and said good things about the second quarter. So you're always trying to piece it together. If you have good and good, but the numbers are the same, that means that the second half is not going to be that good. I don't agree with that, but that's the way people think. Now, uh, look, making things really, really bad. Netflix is now getting hit by currency fluctuations. Oh, my God, it's like Procter & Gamble. For example, well, no, not this one because Procter pulled out of this. But, for example, the collapse of the Argentine peso, down 75% versus the dollar, hit them particularly hard. Their 15% revenue growth would have been 18% of Argentina hadn't fallen apart, but it did. These foreign exchange worries limit how much the analysts can take up their estimates in response to a strong quarter. It is a real overhang. But I think the thing that really spooked, that really spooked shareholders was the fact that starting next year, so important, I got to get this right. Netflix plans to stop providing quarterly numbers for membership or average revenue per member. That's what we used to live on, okay? That was our oxygen. Management basically said that they're making so much money that membership growth is no longer the best indicator of Netflix's future growth. As president and co-CEO Greg Peters put in his conference call, and I'm quoting here, Historical simple math that we all did, number of members times the monthly price, is increasingly less accurate in capturing the state of the business, end quote. Netflix will keep reporting these numbers for the next three quarters, but starting with their first quarter, 2025, over. Personally, I think with management, they, I, I agree with them. I agree with them. I mean, Netflix is entering a new phase, true, where the earnings are what really matters here. But I still think it was kind of a boneheaded move. Because when you start hiding the old key metrics and people regard it as hiding, it empowers the skeptics who think that they have something to hide, even if they're not thinking about the overall totals in the new world. With that in mind, let me walk you through a pair of dueling analysts. One of them updated Netflix on Friday, one of them downgraded. Same information. First, Laura Martin, sometimes she'd be a little incendiary. I kind of like that. At Needham, upgraded the stock from hold to buy, citing the company's global scale, its potential for price increases and ad revenue growth, and even the possibility of using generative AI to bolster its business. She thinks Netflix can use its bountiful free cash flow to buy back stock, which works for me. And she raised her full-year revenue and earnings estimates for uh, both 2024 and 2025. Now, I like some of Martin's arguments better than others. The generative AI argument feels a little nebulous. She says that it, as a tech-first company, Netflix will be better at taking advantage of AI than other media companies. Eh, seems reasonable. But I have no idea if it's true. The rest of it seemed a lot more compelling to me. This is about uh, price increases and wringing more money out of ad-supported business. At the end of the day, Netflix should be able to deliver much better earnings and cash flow. All right, how about the bearish case? This one from Maria Rips at uh, Canaccord Genuity, who downgraded from buy to hold uh, and slashed her price target. All right. It's her view centered on the idea that Netflix has pulled forward membership growth. Key three, pull forward with this password sharing crackdown. And she notes that reduced subscriber disclosures will add to the uncertainty. Told you. Furthermore, Riffs believes that the advertising business will take some time to develop. And given how much the stock has run over the past year, she recommends looking elsewhere for upside. Basically, she says the stock's too expensive and we don't have enough evidence that their modernization plans are working. Now, I am not as impressed with those arguments. First, has Netflix pulled forward membership growth? Look, I guess we'll see. But is it really a bad thing that their crackdown on password sharing has been effective? I mean, are we really supposed to be worried that the lower price ad supported offering has proven to be popular and helped drive some of the best member growth since the pandemic? I say good. Rip says the advertising business is still in its infancy, but I say good thing again. It means there's a lot more runway for growth here. As for the stock being too expensive, hey, I mean, it's just got a heck of a lot cheaper. Overall, I'm more inclined to side with the bulls than with the bears on Netflix. 
Because last Thursday night, we had saw a company that's simply doing much better than expected at its core business of selling subscriptions and quickly building a strong supplemental business selling advertising. I bet the ad business keeps building and quarter after quarter and year after year, which is a good thing, not a reason to go bearish. Most importantly, I see a business that's becoming much more profitable than anyone could have imagined just a few years ago. I can remember when Netflix only traded on subscriber growth, and it was an open question if the company could ever turn a profit. A decade ago, many skeptics still argued that the business was destined for bankruptcy. Oh, boy, am I glad that's not the case and happy to focus on the big profits and the big cash flows. So let me give you the bottom line here. Netflix may have sold off hard because they'll stop providing quarterly subscriber numbers starting next year, which does feel ominous. Actually, I'm not worried because this company has pivoted from a pure growth story to a profitable growth story. And going forward, profitability is what you should be watching. That's why I'm siding with the bulls here and sticking with Netflix, especially now it's gotten substantially cheaper despite reporting an excellent quarter. And believe me, do not these people deserve the benefit of the doubt? Let's go to Greg in Illinois. Greg. Jimmy, chill in electrifying Pepe with hat to booyah. Man, Let me tell I- you, Jim. Nelson Peltz, he knows nothing, and Bob Iger is the man. Although Netflix is pushing media stocks down, I'm seeing JPM and BOA price targets on Disney at 140 and 145 as of last week. I want to take my kids to Disneyland and watch ESPN, Jim. Are you buying here, and can we get back to 124 where we were just a couple I, weeks ago? Well, you know, first of all, I, I commend your enthusiasm, which is really terrific. Uh, and uh, that matters, okay? It, and I, that, it, it definitely matters. You're completely wrong. Um, okay, understand. Disney just has been a one-way trip to the uh, to the danger zone since uh, Nelson Peltz was no longer involved. The stock goes down pretty much every day. I managed to sell a lot when Nelson didn't get on because I felt that if Nelson got in that boardroom, we would have a shake-up and some discipline. I've been proven right, but I will do. I, I'm going to keep agreeing with you on this. I love to go to Disneyland. I love to go to Disney World, but my kids don't want to go with me, and I think it'd be really creepy if I went by myself. All right, I'm not worried about Netflix. This company has pivoted from a pure growth story to a profitable growth story, and profitability is what you should be watching. Hey, I got so much mad money ahead, it's crazy. Gold is shine this year. So why is Barrett Gold stock lagging? What the heck is that about? I'm sitting down with the company's CEO to get a better real commodity. Then comparing apples and EVs, after the fall in both Apple and Tesla, I'm going to tell you if they have more in common than you think. And, of course, all your calls rapid fire tonight's edition of the lightning round. So stay with Kramer. In the last few months, the price of gold has just skyrocketed, okay? But the stocks of the gold miners, they really haven't kept up at all. Take Barrett Gold, the Canadian producer of gold and copper that's one of the best operators in the industry. Yeah, well, gold prices are up 13% year to date. Barrett stock is actually down 9%. Now, a lot of that's because Wall Street's been very worried about higher production costs. But as I mentioned a few weeks ago, the stock's trading as though nobody believes these higher gold prices can stick. The precious metal got slammed today, but it's still in the 2300s, for heaven's sake. Meanwhile, Barrick's on track to boost production while getting its costs under control as the year goes on. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I look over all the documents and start thinking this is a pretty good buying opportunity with the stock down 4%. We got Mark Bristow on a real good day. Yes, Dr. Mar- Dr. Mark Bristow, welcome back to Mad Money. Hey, Jim, how are you? Well, Mark, I got to tell you, you got to buy back, right? I think it's a heck of a lot cheaper to mine gold by buying back your stock than it is to mine gold by taking those big machines, getting gold out of the ground. And I can't figure it out. So I'm coming to you because I know you got the best properties and I know you know how to control costs better than anybody. Yeah, Jim, uh, as you say, you know, 15 percent rise in the gold price last year, another 15 percent year to date this year. And we're trading at below what we were trading this time last year. It doesn't make sense. But there is a model here that, you know, if you've if you've taken the ride on the physical, you need to rotate some of that back into the equities because you get the gearing, and uh, and we yield a, a dividend. So it's a good story. It's all upside for us. And as I, you and I have discussed many times, we've done nothing to damage the per share value of our business. Oh, nothing at all. I'm thinking the other way, actually. I'm thinking that people refuse to give the miners any credit because they see costs that go up. And instead, they just rather buy the bullion or the GLD. They don't see the upside to this to the actual miners. But haven't there been prolonged periods where the miners have just excelled uh, as gold kind of just crept up? 
You know, um, Jim, if you go back to 2011, you'll remember the conversations we had then where the gold price was going up, the costs weren't inflating, and uh, lots of our uh, peer group went and bought things. But, you know, we in, in Rangold at the time really invested in our future. We're in exactly the same boat today. Gold price has gone up. We're at the, at the peak of our costs. We've all been through cost inflation. We're driving those costs down. We've got 10 years ahead of us of production. We'll work through the cycles. And uh, right now, if you look at the gold price, we're sitting at a $400 margin um, to where we were just a, a few months ago. And, and that translates to over $1,000 on the margin of our production costs. Okay, well, let's look at that. I mean, let's, uh, maybe I'm unfairly picking Carlin, but Carlin's big. Uh, it is, it's very expensive. To, to mine there. Would that be something that's going to drop? Are we at peak column with 1,400? Yeah, you know, we put those two sets of assets together, the Newmont and the Barrick assets. There was a lot to work to do. A lot of investment in stripping, in development, in getting those businesses back where we have a rolling 10-year plan, plan. So, you know, looking forward now, we see those costs slowly coming down as we deal with the, 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 the slower input costs or the lower input costs, as well as better efficiencies. And we've always said this year was our low point in Nevada. And from, from how we grow the production out over the next five years. Okay, so someone looking at your prices, like where your DRC, your Ivory Coast, your Tan, well, Tanzania, I mean, you, these things cost very little. Chile costs very little. Why spend so much money in the United States? These, this is the world's biggest uh, gold endowment. And, uh, you know, in, in Nevada, if you look at uh, Gold Rush, we've just commissioned the first real gold mine that was permitted in the last 20 years in America. And, and what we've brought back to Nevada is the fact that we can mine. And, and when you find things in the Carlin trend, they come in large boxes. I see. And so, you know, we are investing heavily. We are, in fact, on Thursday, we're cutting the ribbon on the new Gold Rush mine. We are developing the four-mile mine. These are big gold mines. Uh, and and I've got no doubt that we'll find more, Jim. Now, how about environmental regulations, uh, costs in the United States? Everything costs more here than it does everywhere else. You know, if you work like we do in the rest of the world and build uh, you know, your license to operate, you can manage these things as we've proved. And and we've got the governor, we've got the, the Republicans and the Democrats at our opening on Thursday. That's great. Well, that's about the only uh, thing we you know, have. We're a, well, look, look, I want to tell you something, and this is why I, th I thought of you, and I'm so glad you're on. Costco has gold, okay? I don't know if you remember at Costco. Yeah. But we, we, yeah. every morning we go in, we try to buy it. They run out of it constantly. There is no doubt in my mind that gold is on people's mind just as much as Bitcoin. It's just different people. And I have never seen you. If you ask Costco, they'll say they've never had a product that they cannot stock for. So nobody has left the idea that gold has a greater store of value than the U.S. dollar, have they? No, and I think that's that, that you know that what we see here is that the the gold price is the only currency that reflects the decline in the U.S. dollar because its peer group is beating it on the downside. I'm glad you said that. I, look, you know I'm a big believer in gold. I'd love it to be the stocks. I can't own stocks. I am a huge, so I, I default to the bullion, but I'm glad to hear that we really are, are on the cusp. Now, when can we come out to see this thing in action? Well, I think this quarter, you know, with the gold price where it is at the moment, um, you've got another whack of margin. And, and on top of that, uh, um, Jim, we have big expansion projects, organic expansion. We didn't buy them. We found them in Barrick. And, and, and so we are pointing to 30% increase in our gold equivalent production out to the end of the decade. 
And that's before we build our minds that we're still going to fight. Oh, my. All right. Well, look, you know, I stay a believer. I think that people don't like the stocks. Sometimes they love the stocks, don't like the bullion. Then sometimes it's this way. Uh, but I am so thrilled that you're coming on and it's going to be so big in Nevada. I thought I'd have to go up to Donlin. Sorry, that's going to leave you that with your mosquito spray. Uh, but it's great to see you, Mark. That's Mark Brister, president and CEO of Barrick Gold, G-O-L-D. The gold miners are going to come back. Man, money's back after the break. Coming up, hit us with your best shot. An electrified fast fire lightning round is next. It is time for the white round. Pretty much more from gold going to this talk. So, bye bye bye. So, give my step for me and blaze him. And then the lightning round is over. Are you ready, Ski? That's the light round. Curtis, what's up? Start with. Brendan in New Jersey. Brendan. Hey, Jim. So I just heard about this company. I have no idea what it does. And I think I should go all in. Upstart. What does it do? And should I go all in? Well, I'd say use this, uh, that's a good way to start. I mean, I'd do a little more homework maybe than just that. But um, OK, this is a, a, a bank holding company. It's artificial intelligence. And I've got to tell you, I don't like it. There are so many good banks. Why not buy J.P. Morgan at a discount? I think that when you look at Upstart versus J.P. Morgan, I, I have to tell you, my stunning conclusion, given the fact that you don't know all that much about it, is that J.P. Morgan is a better bank than Upstart. Who knows? Let's go to Harry in New York. Harry. Mr. Kramer, proud alumnus of the U.S. Naval Academy, class of 88. Well, wow. uh, thank you for serving. And I wish that I, boy, you know, we, we, I wish we'd go down there for, the, for Veterans Day. How can I help? I would love to know your thoughts on a California-based pharmaceutical company. They develop medication for chronic viral infections, and they have a product, Nephi, N-E-F-F-Y, seeking FDA approval. Stock mid-January was just over $6. By the end of March, it was ten twenty-two, and now it's been tumbling down to eight twenty-one. dollars Well, let's say, i got to tell you, um, these stocks that do, it, 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 people are not going to like this, but anything that does immuno, you know, I got to tell you, I am, uh, I am, I am four, four, four square behind, and I know that this is a speculative stock, but this is what we need more pharma companies to do. So I salute you, and I salute that company. Now we're going to Charles in Illinois. Charles. Good afternoon, Jim. I value your opinion. So can Thank you, you tell me if I should buy more, hold what I have, or sell my shares in SGH, Smart Global Holdings? You know, this company missed its quarter by a, an element that was so big that I cannot count as recommending it. I can only count as selling it. Yeah, I'm not kidding. I think it's that bad. Let's go to Donnie in Illinois. Don. Hello, Jim. Hey, Don. Um, within the last week or two, you've spoken well of Embridge. And as an 80-year-old, I've been uh, looking at it, and everything seemed good, but there was some analysts to expressed a concern, and that's the term they use, about its ability to maintain its dividend and service its debt. See, I just don't see that. I mean, I've gone over the cash flows multiple times. We've spoken the company multiple times. I think it does have the cash flows. Now, that is just, you could say, Jim, Enbridge has bagged you before, but it has it. And I think Greg Ebel's a good operator. I'm not going against Enbridge here. I'm just not. Let's go to David in New York. David. You are David. You're up. David? Wow. David yeah, seems David to have... Here. David, there you are. How you doing? I'm doing fine, Jim. Thank you. Really enjoying your show. Thank you. Uh, a current valuation should one be adding to Metronics position? You know, I am shocked that Medtronic's all the way back down to 80 again. We had Jeff Marfo on the show. I think he tells a great story. Uh, by the way, a lot of companies that are doing uh, that uh, colonoscopy do have AI. I know he said he's got AI and the only one. I do have now done enough work to know that the others do too. But that doesn't make Medtronic less attractive. It has many different wheels, lots of good uh, devices that are working. Devices have been down for a couple days, but I think they'll start going up again. And that, ladies and gentlemen, conclusion of the Lightning Round. The Lightning Round is sponsored by Charles Schwab. Coming up, what's to be done with Tesla and Apple? Two stocks under siege. Two companies with much different outlooks. 
Stick with Kramer. Are Tesla and Apple two peas in a pod? Can their stocks find a bottom after spending months in the pea pod of pain? The house of pain. We don't have to wait long for Tesla, do we? Which reports tomorrow. Stocks down and astounding 43% year to date, second worst the SP. We have to wait a week for Apple. Doesn't give us the numbers until May 2nd. But I think there's a great difference between these two, actually. Tesla shares are owned largely by individuals, along with a few vocal fund managers. Those individuals know only one thing. When the stock was much higher, they thought that Tesla was an up stock. Now that it's a down stock, they're selling it. I know that sounds real silly, but there are a lot of homegrown traders who make silly decisions a habit. It's a habit that we're trying to break at the CNBC Investing Club. They're horrendous fellow shareholders when the stock's in decline because they don't want to know what's really going on. They're not interested in cyber truck deliveries or self-driving cars or even cheaper models. They're only interested in getting out before we learn the truth. If the truth is that Tesla's still making money and Elon Musk pulls a rabbit out of the hat, they'll come right back. If he has nothing but self-driving cars, plans, uh, robos, uh, taxis, I mean, I say Hertz wanted to do that, and that fails, so Musk will too. On the other hand, Apple's mostly owned by big institutional money managers, and those institutions don't look at stocks as an up or down entity. In fact, in the case of Apple, they look at iPhone sales, not Macs, not iPads, not watches, not AirPods, certainly not Vision Pros, not even service revenues. If you just look at iPhone sales, we'll most likely get a disappointment (laughs) and a statement about for the weakest. There'll be talk about the developers conference in June and the launch of a new phone in September. But who knows if that can take off without an AI tie-in of some sort. Still, I think the big institutions are looking to buy Apple after the estimate cuts because they're looking forward to those two events. But I expect their interest will remain tepid unless the company can announce that their growth is in the rest of the world is accelerating faster than their business in China is shrinking. And there I'm thinking about uh, Brazil, and, and Indonesia, India. If they present that and give an analysis of how sticky the, the uh, revenue stream is, you know, for service, then I think the stock can bottom somewhere slightly below here. Why, why is Apple OK if it disappoints while Tesla's very much not? I think it's because Wall Street's no longer presuming Tesla will have a miss. It's presuming they'll have a loss. If it doesn't lose money, then the messianic buyers, and I'm talking about Kathy Wood or Ron Barron, will step in and call it an amazing buying opportunity on our network, most likely. They can draw a line in the sand and make it work, but not up here because Tesla's feeling mighty like a car company with the wrong product line, electric vehicles, when everyone who wants one seems to have one already, and there's no new product refresh. Car companies get very, very low price earnings multiples. Apple, on the other hand, does have a refresh, and we do know that refreshes are reasons to buy, not sell. It, it, there's no pulling a rabbit out of a hydra. There's just an incrementally better product that gives institutions a reason to buy this high-quality company with a stock that now sells at a lower multiple than we've gotten used to. It's a slim read, I know, but Apple does make a lot of money. It just doesn't grow as fast as we'd like. Some people say there's no growth at all. If you think there's no iPhone refresh ahead, the stock would, per, would absolutely be a sell at below market uh, multiples on declining earnings. Now, I could easily see it trading down to 120 in that scenario, but fortunately, that's not the scenario we live in. And here's the real difference between Apple and Tesla. The institutions who own Apple would never let the stock fall that low. They'd find some way to justify paying more, more than that price. But those institutions don't care about Tesla at all. And there isn't enough retail money to staunch the decline. Worst case scenario, Apple, you can buy Apple 160 and then scale in. I would do it every five points, getting bigger as you approach the 130. So I think the longs will make a stand based on next year's earnings estimates. Not pretty. But you know what? It's always good to know the parameters of a stock, the stock that you advocate owning and not trading. I like to say there's always more work somewhere. I promise I'll find it just for you right here on Mad Money. I'm Jim Cramer. See you tomorrow. Last call starts now. All opinions expressed by Jim Cramer on this podcast are solely Cramer's opinions and do not reflect the opinions of CNBC, NBC Universal, or their parent company or affiliates, and may have been previously disseminated by Cramer on television, radio, internet, or another medium. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Jim Cramer as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of his opinion. Cramer's opinions are based upon information he considers reliable, but neither CNBC nor its affiliates and or subsidiaries warrant its completeness or accuracy, and it should not be relied upon as such. To view the full Mad Money Disclaimer, please visit cnbc.com forward slash Mad Money Disclaimer.